This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of April 18th, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, We have an extended conversation about the pros and cons of, and the alternatives to, a constitutional convention. Second, we explain why we think it's fiscally irresponsible of the House to be rolling out new, permanent spending bills without first resolving a long-term fiscal plan. And third, we discuss a recent op-ed in the ADN, which, we think, does an excellent job outlining what we think is a key criteria in the upcoming congressional election. And now, let's join Michael. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, comes on board to talk with us. Now, normally, we do the weekly top three, and we may do that today. If Brad is kind enough to uh, stick with us, we may bleed on over into hour two a bit. Uh, But we wanted to give this first uh, topic here... Uh, an inordinate amount of consideration because it's an important issue, and I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of confusion, there's a lot of uncertainty, and I think in some cases justifiably so. Uh, but we're going to start off our conversation today with Brad Keithley, and we're going to discuss specifically the Constitutional Convention. It is a it is a thing, and uh, it's coming up. Like I said, once every 10 years, it pops up and and gives us the option to revisit our own constitution. And other states have done so. Other states have done some good work. We've had some discussions with experts on this. Um, But uh, there's also some, I think there's some potential pitfalls. And I know that a lot of people are are a little leery of it. Let's let's dive into this. Now, you and I touched briefly on this last week, and I said, you know, we should do more of an in-depth show on this um, because as soon as people started talking about the CONCON, and I think State Senator Mike Shower is probably one of the more vocal proponents of it, um, I understood where he was coming from. I agreed with him that it was probably really one of the only ways we were actually going to be able to do something like enshrine the, the, the PFD formula in the Constitution, create a constitutional spending cap, and doing a few other things. But I also was a little – the hairs on the back of my neck just stood up because I was like, ooh, man, you, you open the door and it's, it's like be careful what you wish for um, because it opens the door not just for your changes – but for other people's changes, and I, and that really kind of worried me. Some of those fears have kind of been allayed, and I, I mean, I'm leaning more towards a positive on the con-con thing, but uh, I got to be honest, I'm still not 100% in either camp. Give us your take on this uh, and and your your decision-making process in, as you decide to look this over. Well, I think, I think it's important to recognize that it's still early. There's a lot of discussion that's yet going to occur on this. Uh, there's a lot of uh, ways that it can play out in the in the legislature, for example, um, although there's not much time left for the legislature to have a have a say in it before we get to the election. So these uh, this discussion is going to be sort of the first, probably, of many we will have over the course of the of the year about uh, about how uh, how both of us uh, uh, feel about this issue. At, at this point, I mean, I I fully understand the frustrations that are leading 
those who are pushing for the Constitutional Convention to do so. Um, the, the, the legislature, as we talked about last week, the legislature is lawless. I mean, the legislature has stopped following statutes that were enacted to govern its own behavior. Uh, the 90-day uh, rule, 90-day session rule is, is, a, is an example that we talked about on last week's show. The PFD statute is, a, is the shining example that, uh, that, may, yet, uh, that may push us into, in, into, into a constitutional convention. And the defenders, the, the, the constitutional defenders, the group that uh, uh, John Coghill and Kathy Giesel and, and others are, uh, are spearheading, uh, they're not doing anything to alleviate, uh, to alleviate the concern. I mean, their argument is, well, we can always amend the Constitution. If, you, if, if your concern is that the Constitution doesn't represent uh, what, it, what, it, what it should, that it, there should be additional provisions, we can always amend, to, amend it. Well, the problem is, under the Constitution, the only way you can get to an amendment is through the legislature. Right. And if the, le if the legislature's gone lawless, which, it, which they have, if the legislature's gone lawless, then that they're not going to rein themselves in as as they're committing these lawless as they're committing these lawless acts. They're not going to rein themselves in by by adopting a constitutional amendment that would that would force them back back between the ditches. So it's that's not a solution. I mean, the the because we cannot initiate a constitutional amendment by 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 uh, initiative. Uh, by petition, uh, it's not a solution that, that the Constitution can be amended because the very body that's creating the problem is the body that would have to initiate the amendment. So right. that's, not, that's not a persuasive argument to me. And in fact, each time I hear that argument, I get more and more, it pushes me more and more to the side um, <laughs> of a constitutional convention. I, right. And, and, they're and like, they've got the, they got the keys jangling and they're like, look, you guys can change it. I mean, you got to come to us and we're the ones that have been breaking the law and that's why you're mad in the first place, but you could change it. Here are the keys. You could come on over, come on over. I mean, you got the, get the lunatics with the keys to all the cell doors and they're like, Oh, come on over. We'll take care of you. Don't worry about it. See, you don't have to go the other way. Don't look at that. Look at what we're giving you here. Yeah. And, and, and the problem is, I mean, the, what what sort of what sort of you know reemphasizes that or or doubles up on that reaction to their argument is the very ones who are the lawless ones are the ones making it. It's like you know Coghill voted you know voted to cut the PFD uh, despite the statute. Giesel led the way to cut the PFD despite the statute. Bryce Edgman, who's in the leadership of uh, of that effort, uh, is leading the effort in the in the current legislature to continue to cut the PFD. Uh, uh, despite the statute. So it, it's, it's, I mean, what's, what's really galling about all this is they're sort of going, you know, yeah, yeah you can amend it, but by, by the way, we're the very ones who are the gatekeepers for those amendment process. And we're never, we're never going to let you do that. So it's, you're, you're right. It's, it's the keys jangling, but it's, it's the, it's the, it's the fact that the ones who are being lawless are the ones who are making the argument. Essentially, let us continue to be lawless. Ha 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 ha. Right, exactly. And, it's, and and that's, I mean, that that each time I, as I say, each time I hear that, uh, it just pushes me more and more toward uh, toward the constitutional convention side. Well, and it's not but, it's not hypothetical, Brad, I mean, because we've seen the governor has put out uh, a couple in the last, you know, in the last two section uh, halves of the session here. He's put out proposals that are constitutional amendments, and they just go, oh, yeah, that's nice, and they slide it in a drawer, and they close the drawer, and that's it. There's no discussion. Constitutional amendments that would fix some of the problems that we're having, and they're like, oh, yeah, thanks for the call. And they just slam in the door, and away they go. It's This is not a hypothetical. Right. Uh, they slam the door, and away they go, and they continue by they, they continue you know, acting, acting lawlessly by, by, right. by ignoring, uh, ignoring the very statutes that, that they tell others they have to abide by. I mean, statutes are law, right? And they tell everybody else outside the legislature, you have to abide by the law, uh, except for us. <laughs> and statutes that we've passed or that, that the le that pre prior legislatures have passed, uh, uh, yeah, we can ignore those. But, but, but the statutes that were adopted by initiative, the 90 day, 90 day session, right? Yeah, we can yeah, it, yeah. It's just, it, it's just, I mean, if we were talking about a constitutional convention about something else and the legislature would consider it and, and consider an amendment and, you know, put it forth 
uh, for for the for the voters to vote on, then yeah, I I you know I could buy that argument that a constitutional convention is unnecessary. But but in this case, I mean, they're 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 they keep pushing me more uh, toward a constitutional convention. The more the more they make that argument. But there's a but. Um, uh -oh. and, and the but basically is I'm not sure a constitutional convention, in fact, I, in fact, I'm very concerned a constitutional convention is not going to resolve the issue that we're all concerned about, the, 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 the PFD issue. And, and the reason for that is while a constitutional, while the call for a constitutional convention is a statewide vote, um, and, and so the Valley, for example, that, that might vote 90% for a constitutional convention can, can, can the Valley in Kenai might vote 90% for a constitutional convention and push it across the line. The constitutional convention itself, once it's formed, is a legislative body. Um, it, it, is, is an, it is elected by district. Uh, it is representative of districts as opposed to representative of a statewide vote. And as we've seen in the current legislature, um, when you have that sort of body, a legislative body, a district elected legislative body, considering issues, uh, they're not they're not you know coming to coming to a solution. Um, and I'm not sure that that you know trying it differently by trying it through a constitutional convention uh, and electing you know, uh, electing a new body to consider this by constitutional convention, electing it by district as we would, is gonna produce any different result than what we've seen uh, coming out of the legislature uh, thus far. So it's, we, we, what I'm concerned about is the constitutional convention becomes another excuse to put off dealing with the issue um, you know, we have, we, let's say we vote for a constitutional convention, then we've got to adopt procedures, then we've got to elect the delegates, then they've got to go through the consideration. And, and I, it, it becomes another reason to say, well, we can't resolve the PFD this year. That's often the constitutional convention. We'll see if it's ever, we'll see how it's handled there. And they just keep putting it off and putting it off. And it never gets resolved there either. Um, so I'm not sure, I'm not sure we're gaining on solving the issue by going down the road of a constitutional convention. And I think a constitutional convention can become a lot more complicated uh, very quickly by a lot of other issues. For example, if the Supreme Court overturns Roe versus Wade um, this summer, as, as a lot of people speculate they might, uh, the, the PFD issue may seem minor by the time we get to the constitutional convention, because we may be having the battle, the mother of all battles about, uh, about the right to privacy plank uh, that's currently in the constitution as interpreted by the Alaska Supreme Court. Right. That's, inter that's, that's currently in the constitution. And that may overwhelm everything uh, and ultimately lead to, you know, a crash and burn of the constitutional convention in, in, in through that issue. Uh, and the PFD just gets pushed off to the side and we never get it resolved. Well, you start looking at who the delegates are going to be. I mean, you know, they, they, anybody who's not sitting in the legislature at that point could basically be up for grabs on it. That doesn't mean that they couldn't pull out some Jennifer Johnstons or some uh, Chuck Cops or Kathy Geisels or John Coghills uh, out of those districts if they get, you know, nominated or put forward for that. Uh, you could end up with a with a constitutional convention that's got, you know, mom and pops and and uh, people like that, but also some political fixers who go in there to try and and work their voodoo on it at the same time. Oh, it'll be heavily lobbied. I mean, wherever it is. I mean, the the 55 constitutional convention was 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 put up in Fairbanks at the at the university to get it away from Juno and get it to away, away from the lobbyists. But in this day and age with airplanes and 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 travel. You know, maybe if they hold it in Nome or someplace, they, they might <laughs> might get away from people. But but there will be lobbyists buzzing around this thing like crazy, and there will be national interest in it. If Roe versus Wade is overturned, there will be national interest in this constitutional convention, like you know we've never seen, and and there will be a lot of of effort made to try to uh, get the constitutional convention to address that issue. Uh, as well as the PFD, as well as any number of other issues that people are going to uh, people are going to propose. So, <coughs> I think on the downside, my my concern is we don't solve the issue. 
I mean, people, people are thinking that the Constitutional Convention solves the PFD issue, right? We'll put the PFD in the, Const the Constitutional, we'll, we'll vote for a Constitutional Convention. The Constitutional Convention will put the PFD in the Constitution. We'll vote to ratify the Constitution. Done. You know, we've actually, we've actually solved the issue. I think the second step of that that the Constitutional Convention actually puts the PFD in the in the Constitution in a way that people think it should be, um, I think that is a very speculative issue, and by and by putting it off to the Constitutional Convention, I, I think uh, I think we're way down the road before uh, b before we find out whether that actually does it or not. Uh, Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We're coming up on the break, and we're going to continue this discussion with him. Uh, when we get back, I want to talk about the timing of it. This is not a quick fix. This is, I mean, this is going to take some time. Uh, and then maybe the ideal situation where this would, and if not this, then what, I guess, will be the three questions that I want to talk with Brad about uh, as we wrap this uh, up into the last segment of this hour. And Brad's agreed to come on over uh, into hour two, and we might spread uh, we might spread two and three out into into hour two. But those are kind of the three things, you know, if not this, then what, you know, the timing of it um, and uh, and any other pitfalls that he may see on this. We'll jump back into it. Somebody quoted Dwayne Bannock in the chat room. The Alaska Constitution is a despicable document. <laughs> I always like to say, well, you know, the Constitution is communistic or socialistic, but I didn't write it. I just have to live underneath of it. So we'll make the best of it as best we can. I wasn't the one that wrote it, although you can't necessarily you can't necessarily blame the framers of the state constitution. Their hands were tied by the federal government at statehood to begin with. That was really a statehood thing uh, that, you know, we really kind of got the sticky shaft on uh, in that regard. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I didn't write the damn thing, but I definitely have to live under it, and that's kind of where we're at right now. Uh, Brad, your thought? Well, yeah, I mean, one, one thing that, uh, that you know, we – we often hear in the PFD debates is, well, just give us back our mineral rights. Well, the state can't do that. I mean, they can't yeah. do that even if we have a constitutional convention, right? Because the mineral rights came, or came from grant by the by the federal government with a right of reverter, as lawyers would say, uh, which is that if the state try to tries to alienate a, a legal word, if the state tries to grant, uh, uh, tries to parcel out those mineral interests to uh, to individuals uh, or to anybody. Um, uh, then um, uh, the the those grants are are unlawful, and the and the mineral rights revert back to the federal government. So there are constraints uh, that are going to be imposed, even uh, in this con even if we have a constitutional convention by by federal law. Right. It's a. I mean, it's a tough situation. I mean, I agree. I didn't. Uh, like I said, I didn't write it, but uh, we definitely have to live within this framework. And if it if it is the law, then we should hashtag. Follow the damn law. Uh, that just seems to make you know seems to make the most sense here. Um, uh, ja, ja, Jim says Coghill and Giesel would probably be selected as constitutional delegates. Uh, it's possible. I mean, that's the thing. You got a lot of people out there, uh, and I know Mike Showers like, oh well, they probably would just pick regular mom and pops, and they don't. I don't. I think that that's a little naive. I think that they're going to pick. Uh, you know, the people who are the most vocal and most vociferous and those who have got something to win or lose on this are the ones that are going to be vying for those spots. And so it's going to be contentious. Um, oh, it's, it's hugely naive to think it's going to be mom and pops. I mean, money, there's going to be money coming into the election of the delegates. Yeah. I mean, the, the oil companies are going to be concerned about what the heck the, the, the you know delegates might do to the to the oil industry. Fishing industry is going to be concerned about what the delegates might do to the fishing industry. Um, uh, the top 20% are going to be concerned about what, you know, the delegates might do. I, if, again, if Roe versus Wade is overturned this summer, uh, we're going to see all sorts of national money come piling in uh, to, uh, uh, to, to affect it. So it's, yeah, it's, it's very naive to think it's going to be ordinary mom and pops. It's going to be, there's going to be a lot of money coming into this. Yeah. And I could see nothing but, I could see but nothing but former uh, former legislators getting the nod on a lot of the stuff on both sides of the aisle. Uh, you know, Michael, I, there's not a prohibition on existing legislators that I know of. There's not one in the Constitution. And there were legislators elected to the 1955 convention. 
I thought there was a I thought there was a restriction on serving legislators. Maybe I'm wrong. I thought there was a restriction on sitting legislators being part of the process. Uh, but maybe maybe who picks the delegates, Brad? I mean, that's it's a nomination and a vote, right? So I mean, well, <laughs> it's it's an election, and 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 here's I mean we'll we'll talk about this when we come back on the air in terms of timing. But it's the Constitution says in the absence of of, of a, a statute enacted now to govern the procedures that we're supposed to use the procedures that were that were used in 1955. Well, in 1955 they used electoral districts to uh, to elect uh, the delegates, but those electoral districts no longer match one man one vote. So the question is going to be. You know, whether we use those old electoral districts or whether we have to adopt new electoral districts. And that issue is going to be up to the legislature, at least in the initial issue. The existing, well, whatever legislature is elected, elected, elected next, uh, well, it could or could not be. It depends on whether the governor would try to do it by special session. But it, it's going to be up to, to whatever legislature addresses that issue uh, uh, with respect to uh, with respect to what the districts are. So. Yeah, it's a hot mess. Let's just put it that way. Uh, Rob Meyer says, so here's the thing about the delegates. How many people do you know that you would love to see in the legislature but would never do it because they don't want to bear their souls every two years or take four months off from their lives every year? But they might be persuaded to do it once for three months. We have a much better chance to get good people to participate as statesmen <laughs> I, uh, in a constitutional convention. Um, I, well, there's a lot to unpack there. There's, there's a lot to unpack there. Before we jump into it, hold on, Brad. You can comment on this on the other side. I'll reread the question. Continuing now, Brad Keithley, our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We're focusing down on really the top one today, which is the Constitutional Convention. And there's a lot of reasons uh, to be uh, positive about it. But there's also, you know, there's some pros, but there's also some cons. And some of the, the con cons, the con con cons. Uh, there's also some other ones. Uh, part of the problem is, of course, that it's a mini legislative body by the time it's all said and done, and it's done by district. And the question is, will it be filled with politicos or will there be uh, or will it be normal, average, everyday people? And we've seen some discussions. Mike Shower has talked about how he feels like uh, you'll get some average Joes in there and everything else, although I, I think that that's a little optimistic uh, Rob Myers in the chat room with us today says, so here's the thing about delegates. How many people do you know that would love to see uh, who you would love to see in the legislature, but would never do it because they don't want to bear their souls every two years or take four months off from their lives every year, but they might be persuaded to do it once, once for three months. We have a much better chance to get good people to participate as statesmen in a constitutional convention. And while I agree that there is a higher probability that something like that could happen, I don't think that by any means it's a lock that you will get a majority of people to show up like that. Uh, Brad was ch- choking; he was laughing. At the, he, he, I think I don't think he believes that that's the hundred percent the truth. Brad, give me your thoughts on this. Well, I I started laughing at the three months. I don't think this thing gets. I, I it, it took seventy some odd days uh, for the for the prior. Uh, for the 1955 Constitutional Convention, and and frankly, they weren't dealing. They were all of their. Uh, they were all there, frankly, of one mind, which was to get a document that that enabled statehood, um, and and they adopted the principle of being simplistic and and having a short document and not trying to be prescriptive about how the how the government would operate. Uh, so it was. It, here we're going to have people who are trying to dive down into. The issues of fiscal policy and the PFD, and as I say, if Roe versus Wade is overturned, you know the whole abortion issue. Uh, here we're going to have you know some very tough issues that people are trying to resolve. So I think three months is a little is a little uh, optimistic. There's no restriction uh, that I recall out of the 1955 convention on doing it that you only have three months to do it. So. Um, I think, and, and you throw in the lobbyists, and you throw in all sorts of other factors. Uh, I, I think three months is a little uh, is a little optimistic. Plus, I don't think this election is like is different than any other. I mean, we might we might hope that that candidates could just run on their on their platforms or on being leaders or on being good people or on being you know positive uh, positive Alaskans. But if this thing, again, if Roe versus Wade is, over, particularly if Roe versus Wade is overturned, 
if this thing uh, uh, gets going, those elections are going to be uh, just like any other. They're going to you're going to have opponents trying to dig out dirt uh, on uh, on candidates that may deem to be ahead. You're going to have the newspapers wanting to dig into the background of the candidates, um, and and I and I think the same the same restrictions on people, you know, not wanting to put themselves you know through the ringer to run for the legislature or run for Congress or run for governor, I think the same restrictions are going to apply. Once they sort of think about it, I think those same restrictions are going to apply to people wanting to run for, uh, uh, for, the, for the Constitutional Convention. And one more time, there's going to be money. There's going to be money. I mean, we, this legislature hasn't even adopted restrictions. This legislature hasn't adopted restrictions on, on, on giving Campaign. to candidates yeah. for the legislature. That would apply also to candidates for the Constitutional Convention. Uh, and I, there's going to be money in here that I think is going to, you know, play a factor as well. So I, I, I'm not, I mean, I understand Rob's, Rob's vision. I understand Mike's vision, but I just don't think that's how it plays out in practice. Well, and let's talk about the timing. You just mentioned that three months is what he was saying, but it could, there's no restriction. It could be twice that long. It could be more. Uh, and I think a lot of people think of the con con as kind of an open and shut thing, but this is a process that's going to take four years, three years, four years, five years. I mean, we don't, I mean, at this point, you know, it's, it's a lengthy process. It's a minimum of a couple, two and a half, three years. I mean, this is a long-term deal. It could go even longer. Well, the constitution provides that in the absence of, of a procedural, the, the legislature is setting us, set, setting forth procedures that this, that the constitutional convention would follow the procedures of the 1955 Constitution, uh, uh, Constitutional Convention. Plus, the, the Constitution provides that the election would be the election of delegates would be at the next statewide election, which would be in 2024, um, uh, if the Constitutional Convention is passed in uh, in 2022. That's the time that we would elect the right. delegates under the Constitution in the absence of in the absence of the legislature specifying something else before then. I tell you, I think I think there's a big issue that's going to show up right up front. Which is what are the what? How do we elect delegates? What are the delegate districts, um, and and how are we going to apportion <coughs> delegates among those districts? In 1955, there were the delegates were apportioned to electoral districts, and then some of the delegates were elected statewide. Um, the problem with or the challenge is going to be. Uh, you know, exactly. If, 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 we, if the legislature doesn't enact anything else, the Constitution says we follow the 1955 procedures. The problem with the 1955 procedures is those electoral districts that we used in 1955 don't meet one man, one, one, uh, one vote requirements anymore. But here's an issue. Uh, the issue is federal law is not settled on whether one man, one vote, which is a federal constitutional standard, applies to constitutional conventions. So I can easily see a situation in which we get a challenge. If we try to use those 1955 electoral districts, we get a challenge uh, that they don't meet one man, one vote. And we've got to work our way up through the federal, uh, appell the federal, federal judicial system on whether one man, one vote is going to apply to, those, to, uh, to our election of, uh, of delegates. It's not a settled federal issue it's not the supreme court hasn't decided right the case it's not case law not. yet yep right. so I, I i think i think we've got a very long process i mean a lot of people who want to impose procedural hurdles on this process have a lot of opportunities to interject court challenges and, and court issues uh into the process so, uh, again, a longer process than we probably anticipate. Lots of opportunities for court challenges uh, and everything else. This leads me to my final question for, I guess, this segment, and I'll let you run out the segment with this. But so if not this, then what, Brad? I mean, this this does have opportunities. It does have pitfalls. But really, it is the shiny object in the room at this point. It seems to be the only true way because as you said, you pointed out the hypocrisy of these people saying, well, you've got a way to amend the Constitution. You just got to come to us hat in hand. And if we feel like it, you will maybe we'll talk to you, you know, but this this seems like the only real solution, even with its pitfalls. If not this, then what? Well, I think I think if you if you take, as I do, that the PFD is the driving force 
uh, in, in, in driving this issue, uh, at least now, before, before the Supreme Court addresses Roe versus Wade. If you take that the driving force in this is, is, the, is the PFD, then I think the, the solution that, that avoids all this is to come to a fiscal policy compromise uh, in the legislature adopted by the governor uh, and resolve this issue before we, before we throw it into a constitutional convention. And I, and I think that's okay because I don't think a constitutional convention ultimately, because it is a legislative body, I don't think a constitutional convention ultimately is going to come to any de any different uh, uh, resolution uh, of the fiscal issue than a compromise. I think if it if it gets resolved there, it's going to be resolved uh, as a compromise there. The problem is, you know, we've known that we need to compromise for what the past six years. We haven't compromised for the past six years, right? Uh, and and if we don't compromise by November, then the judgment is going to be well. Do we force the do we vote to force a constitutional convention to try to force them to compromise? But even then, they don't have to compromise. I think they just run the clock out on a constitutional convention, never come to a resolution, never put one in front of the people, and 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 all we've done is just kick this can down the road uh, even further. I the, the 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 solution to this is is to find a way to get a fiscal uh, policy agreement uh, out of the legislature and out of the governor. Uh, whether we do that's an open question, but that's that's the better way to do this, I think, than going down the road of a constitutional convention. I, I'm, you know, I don't. I'm even more torn than when we got started at this point, uh, because you know, again, I, I mean, I was, I was definitely for me in the very beginning, there were definitely more cons than there were pros. Um, I was kind of swayed a little bit back more towards the pro side here a little bit ago, and now the more I think about it, I just. I don't know, because, again, this is politics and whether we want to think that it's not, whether we want to think that good people will now have a greater opportunity to get elected. But you've made you've made valid points that, again, this will be an election like no other. And with unlimited campaign contribution limits, uh, it will be a no holds barred money brawl fest, uh, and which, of course, in most cases, in most instances, raises the worst of the worst to you know, to to the people that goes in there. I mean, it, it could be a hot mess. You got about ninety seconds here. Well, I mean, just think, just focus on oil for a second. Oil is not going to let this election go without trying to influence it. Right. Oil is going to get in there and and want their candidates to run because they don't want a constitutional convention that can do something to them. So this is unlike fifty five. Fifty five, we were sort of a backwater state. We didn't have much oil. We didn't. We had fish was our big deal. Um, and there was some fish money in the in the 55 election, but not a whole lot. This is entirely different. We are now we're now dealing with real live economic issues and people who have interests in those issues are going to invest a lot of money in making sure that those interests are protected from the get go. So it's a um, it, it's it, 55. You sort of expected people of, of, of you know community leaders to stand up and do it. I, I think this is entirely different some point, I feel like I just want to throw my hands in the air and go, you know, you guys sort it out and walk away. <laughs> you, know, just, you guys just figure this out. I'm, I'm done. I've been trying this for 20, 25 years. You know, you got, you just, I've been telling you, this is the thing. This is the worst part. I've been telling everybody that there's a problem. And I'm not saying that I have every answer, but I've pointed out some big, you know, you, you know, you guys got big brains. I've been pointing out the problems and saying, here's my suggestion. I don't have all the answers, but we can at least move in this direction. And they all look at me like I'm stupid and then walk away. And then, of course, 15 years later, they go, well, you know, this was really where the problem was. That's what I've been saying for 15 years. I mean, you know, it's just at some point I just want to go, hey, you want to talk about, I don't know, cookie recipes. I, I just don't even care at this point sometimes. It's, just, it's so frustrating. And now to get down to this and think, well, maybe it'll work. And then as you point out some of the things that I hadn't considered, I'm like, it, it's all polit. It's just, I just, I just want to go home and have a drink. It's six 30 in the morning and I want to go home and have a drink. Uh, you know, I mean, th this is, this is where we're at, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and, and that's why, you know, I'm, I was really excited about the fiscal policy working group. I was excited about the results of the fiscal policy working group. It wasn't exactly what I would have what I would have done, but hey, they got to a resolution, and it was it was between the ditches somewhere. Um,
and I thought, okay, now we're gonna now we're gonna get someplace. And then it just you know it just gets ignored because because leadership doesn't like the results that came out of the fiscal policy working group. And you've got legislators who are now you know who were key in it, like Jonathan Christ Tompkins, uh, who are now you know not gonna run again. And and we're sort of we're sort of gonna start all over again. I I think I think about about a year or two years if we vote for a con con about a year or two years into that process, we're going to look back at the fiscal policy working group and say, hey, that was a great idea. Why, why didn't we do that? Right. Exactly. Why didn't we adopt that and just move on? Yeah, no. I, and, and that's what I've been. I mean, the frustration level for for me is uh, amazing. I can't imagine what it must be for these people that went through 90 hours, 100 hours of all this work to put together this bipartisan idea to come together to all of them, kumbaya, even though they're so philosophically opposed at so many levels, but to vote unanimously on this thing and then to have everybody go, <laughs> jog on. I mean, you know, like, what the, I mean, what the hell? This may, this may be, this may be the core of it. I, I think people think CONCON, I know some people think CONCON is if they just vote for a constitutional convention, we get a constitutional convention, they win. We get a, we get a, statutory pfd embodied in the constitution we win and and so that's the that's the sense that they're bringing to it that's not going to happen it's going to be another legislative process the best that's going to come out of it is is a a compromise and in and, and it's going to be delayed by several years before we even get there i think we ought to we i think we should have and 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 should grab the compromise that came out of the fiscal policy working group uh, and move on. I don't think the CONCON is going to produce anything better than that. Um, and, and, and we're just going to go through a process and open ourselves up to all sorts of other things uh, uh, just to get back to the same place that we were, you know, last summer. Right. I mean, th- yeah, there really should be a mandate from leadership to say, hey, this was a pretty good idea. Maybe we should discuss this amongst ourselves now since we've been ignoring it. Um, Hawk says, Brad contradicted himself. He basically said that a constitutional convention wouldn't do any good. Then he said the oil companies didn't want a con con because of what might happen. He's not making any sense. That's not what Brad said. Brad said that the oil companies would pour money into it to protect their interests. He didn't say that they didn't want it to happen. If it does happen, they will be there with their checkbooks out to make sure that whatever does go into that does not harm them. Am I right? I mean, that's, that's part of the problem of what we're saying here. Is that the Constitutional yeah, Convention wouldn't do any good for us, uh, potentially, but that all the spe- – it's a, somebody said earlier it was an all-you-can-eat buffet of special interests. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, it's – the oil companies probably don't want a Constitutional Convention, but if there is a Constitutional Convention, they're going to make sure they have, they have a role, a big role in that, in, in that Constitutional Convention. So there will be money going in to defend the Constitution, that group – to try to stop a constitutional convention, but if it passes, but, but here's the thing, don't think, don't think that passing a constitutional uh, convention solves the PFD. It doesn't. It just sets up another legislative body to address it. And the legislative body, that legislative body, the constitutional uh, convention to address it is not going to be any different. There's, it's not going to have any different dynamics than, than the legislative body that we have now. Uh, addressing it. Don't vote for a constitutional convention thinking that the next day you get a PFD, constitutional PFD. That's not that's not the resolution. Right. It's just the start of a new battle. It's the start of a new battle with some of the same players in a different role or, you know, I mean, yeah, exactly. Now we are going to dive into the remaining two of the weekly top three, which includes a discussion on the House, you know, pressuring and pushing forward on all this forward funding without a fiscal plan. And also the one thing you should really think about when you pick uh, out of the 48, your one candidate for that special election in June, let's start off with number two here, the forward funding issue without a fiscal plan, Brad, what, what say you? Well, the house has started to pass bills uh, that are committing the state to future, uh, future spending. Uh, The house passed last week, uh, HB 55, I think it is which is uh, creates a defined benefit plan for first responders. Um, as we've talked on prior shows, that's sort of the crack in the door. Once they get a defined benefit plan going, 
the 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 push will come to add teachers and then add other state employees and and on and on and on. But this is this is the first crack in it, uh, which is to uh, 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 create a defined benefit plan for uh, for first responders. Uh, in a second bill, they uh, passed a, a bill that would restore and 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 set up in the same way as uh, uh, the PCE uh, set up in the same protected way uh, as the uh, power cost equalization uh, payments or the power cost equalization fund. Uh, they would set up a fund for uh, the higher ed uh, uh, college uh, scholarship program. Uh, that the college scholarship program or the, the funds for the higher education uh, scholarship program were swept uh, last year um, uh, into the uh, CBR uh, as part of uh, as part of the governor's uh, uh, the administration's uh, sweep of funds after the legislature had finished appropriating, um, and they were the higher scholar the higher ed funds were uh, were not protected. Uh, they were in the general fund. They were a subcategory of the general fund and thus subject to sweep. They got swept in, and everybody got concerned all of a sudden that there weren't going to be college scholarship funds uh, adequate to to fund the, the college scholarship program that. That the universities relied on. This really goes back to university funding more than anything else, um, and and so the legislature had had a bill in front of it, has a bill in front of it that would set these funds aside, the higher ed funds aside, put them in a in a specialized fund under a corporation, the same way that the PCA, PCE funds are, uh, that at least the superior court found uh, were is a way of protecting it from sweep, from being swept. Uh, and it would do that for the higher ed scholarship fund. So the the legislature is in the, the House passed both those bills last week. So the legislature, the House at least, is in the process of beginning to make commitments uh, for future spending. We're going to have the BSA bill, the 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 increase in the in the K through twelve BSA uh, come through House Finance, go to the House floor, and it's likely going to pass because you know it's about the children. And, and we all want to respond to education uh, will, be the, will be the four speeches and they'll pass that. Here's the problem. They're passing these, these bills that commit the state to increase spending uh, going forward or in the case of the higher ed scholarship fund, setting aside funds that otherwise could be used uh, to, to fund general programs, setting them into a special category and, dedicate, and designating uh, those <laughs> funds uh, for, that, uh, for that category taking them off the table to be used for other categories. They're going ahead and doing that. And we don't have a fiscal plan. So you really can, what you really ought to be thinking about these bills as doing is passing PFD cuts. Each time you pass a spending bill and you don't have a fiscal plan, you don't have alternate revenues in place, or you don't have offsetting spending cuts being enacted someplace else, what you're doing is you're increasing the draw on, in, on future PFDs. You're passing PFD cut bills. Um, and, and nobody, I think, nobody on the House floor articulated it that way uh, during the debate, but that's exactly what we're doing. And, and I, think it's, I think, frankly, it's irresponsible to, to, to be passing these spending bills, making commitments regarding future spending making commitments to restore a defined benefit program, making commitments to set aside funds uh, uh, for the higher scholarship funds, making commitments uh, in the case of the BSA to increase uh, the BSA. I think it's irresponsible to be passing those bills uh, without having resolved the fiscal situation and know how you're gonna pay for them, uh, uh, have a vote on how you're pay gonna pay for them at least because, because all you're doing is you're really committed. You're really committing just to future PFD cuts, uh, without saying it, without admitting right. it, without without acknowledging it, and without having a vote on whether that's the right way to be paying for things. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, without it, those, you're basically in, in encumbering future commitments from uh, um, from citizens from one form or another. PFD cuts, new taxes, whatever it is, you're encumbering them for the future without that legislature being able to take a vote on it. And I think that that's problematic. And really. Uh, it comes back to, of course, this whole question of designated and designated and everything else. I mean, they may be skirting the I mean, they're violating the spirit of the law, if not the letter of the law at this point, as you said, based on a superior court uh, judgment ruling. They didn't get to the Supreme Court. But I mean, at some point, somebody's going to have to say, well, what did the framers intend when they said no dedicated funds? 
Well, we designated, and then we put them in a state corporation, and we did this, and so, you know, it's really not dedicated, but it's, you know, it has all the features of dedication without the designation of dedication, de- designation. You know, we're, get, we're getting to a place that every, that every fund is going to be protected, except yeah. for the permanent fund. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. I mean, we're, we're setting up a situation where the PCE is protected, where, you know, we're forward funding K through 12. We're, we're, you know, setting the, we're putting the college scholarship funds back, back in a, in a, in a protected category. The only thing that's going to be unprotected and thus the thing that's going to be taken to pay for all this is PFD cuts, taxes on middle and lower income Alaska families. So right. I just think it's, I, I think it's irresponsible of the legislature uh, to be doing that. I, I, you know, Sarah Rasmussen voted for it. That's just another flip on, on her part. She says she's for protecting the PFD, but then she votes for legislation like this, that, you know, that leads to, uh, leads to future PFD cuts. I think it's just, the, the legislature is just, I mean, <laughs> we were talking in the last segment about a lawless legislature. This isn't lawless. They can do this, but I think it's irresponsible. It's fiscally irresponsible to keep going down this road without having the debate and, and and resolving uh, how we're how we're paying for this stuff in the future. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, all right. Well, we got about uh, seven eight minutes here, uh, so let's talk about uh, number three, which is your choice of uh, you know you got people got fifty eight forty eight uh, candidates to choose from um, in this uh, in this upcoming special primary election for the congressional seat, and you say that there should be one thing that they're looking for. In those, I mean, Brad is picking the one thing. Pick the one thing for me, Brad. Uh, so what, what is the one thing we should be looking for in a candidate as we look at this uh, 48, crowd of 48 here? Well, we had a discussion on the show a couple of weeks ago about a chart I was building for uh, how, how to evaluate uh, the congressional candidates. And I did a subsequently, did a, subsequently did a column for one of my Friday columns for the Alaska man, uh, landline that, uh, landmine that went through those criteria and why I why I believe those criteria was, was were important. One of the criteria uh, is the ability to work across the aisle, the ability to compromise. And, and as I said in the landmine column, and as I think I said on the show, that is a critical criteria to me because Alaska has one representative. I mean, you look at some of these other states that have legislators who are either members of the squad or like uh, MTG is, you know, or, or whatever the heck her name is from Colorado, Bobert, Bobert, uh, yeah. that, is, right, yeah. that is off to the right. I mean, they have other representatives in those states that can look after those states' interests. So they can afford somebody uh, to have one of their representatives go off to an extreme. I mean, New York has other representatives. They can have AOC afford to go off and, and, and be go off to the left. And Georgia has other representatives that can look after the state. They can afford to have... Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene go off, uh, go off to the right. Alaska can't afford that. We've got one representative um, that that needs to focus on the state's interests. We can't afford to have a representative that goes down a rat hole of, you know, getting into a caucus or getting into a squad or getting into a uh, into a uh, you know a, a partisan position that uh, that uh, uh, you know sort of forecloses the ability to work across the aisle because you know. Democrats are likely to lose the Congress this year, but they may gain it back in future years, and, and we need somebody to be able to work across. That's what Don Young did. Don Young, as irascible as he was, as, 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 as prone to you know, saying bizarre things as he was, Don Young was able to work across the aisle and used his power that he built up through the committee process and then sustained as a result of his seniority Use that process, I think, to to look after Alaska's interests, not only financially, but as we talked on the show a couple of weeks ago, uh, also our interests in dealing with federal lands and, and federal regulations that uh, that affect Alaska greatly. And the the column that I that I'm referring to, there's a column in the op-ed page um, uh, of the ADN, not an ADN op, uh, editorial, but an op-ed that somebody wrote called Don Young and Overcoming Political uh, uh, Polarization. And I think that's an excellent column. It, it, su- it summarizes sort of this issue of someone who's able to work across the aisle. So when I look at candidates, I'm going to look at one of the criteria that's important to me, maybe the most important, but certainly an important criteria, 
is, is the candidate able to work across the aisle? Or is the candidate someone who's prone to getting himself or herself off in one of these corners, like, like, like the members of the squad or MTG or others, uh, prone to sort of run off into a partisan corner and, uh, and, and lose the ability to work across the aisle? I think the column captures that criteria uh, very well. And for people who, uh, who want to know what, what are the important criteria, not just, oh, I like Sarah, or oh, I like Josh, or oh, I like Tara. Uh, people who want to want to think through the criteria that they're using to judge these candidates, I think that column is a great place to, uh, to sort of get a, a sense of what's important from uh, the ability to work across the aisle. <clears throat> I immediately start seeing comments in the chat room about how we don't want to work with the dirty, dirty communists. We don't want to do this. We don't want to do. That. I just, I just, I start to wonder when did cooperation become a bad word? Uh, when did you know? When did uh, uh, you know? And and I'm not talking about compromising first principles. I'm just talking about when did walking across the aisle to somebody who you disagree with and trying to work through your differences. When did that become bad? When did I mean? You know, everything is so divided. And I know everybody's going to say, well, they, they did it. I'm just saying, look, they may have done it first. We may have done it first. We may have done it last. We may have done it better. They may have done it better. I don't know. But when did it become such a dirty word for people to try and come together and find some common ground that now, I mean, it's just this polarization is, is I mean, it is destroying us. It is literally destroying this country. Uh, it's destroying the world. And, and, it has come to the point to where it's all extremes. You cannot be trying to find any kind of common ground with somebody who you disagree with philosophically. Yeah. And I, and I don't mean somebody, I mean, I, I'm not a particular fan of Al Gross. I, I, I don't mean somebody who just says they can work across the aisle or I'm an independent so I can work across the aisle. Somebody, somebody who has a demonstrated track record and uses rhetoric that, that reaches across the aisle and builds majorities you can't always count. I mean, the, part of the problem that we're in with ANWR, part of the problem that we're in with NPRA is it's become very partisan. And so the Republicans, you know, free it up, open up NPRA or open up, open up ANWR. And then the Democrats shut it down. Well, there's a, there's a middle ground in there that would get it open, maybe not as completely open as we want it, but would get it open. There's a compromise on the PFD that would get a PFD established in, and we could go on and, and with the rest of our lives. It, it, to think that there's a partisan solution to everything that's going to be a lasting partisan solution is just false. It's just, it, 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 you're, you're, you're kidding yourself. So yes, go work with the Republicans, only work with Republicans, get Anwar open. And then the next time there's a Democrat Congress, bam, then we're closed again. Right. Get, and, and we're not, we're never going to get investment. We may get Anwar, we may, people may say it's open, but we're never going to get investment if we're running back and forth between those two extremes. Find somebody who can work the middle and, and create durable solutions. Yeah. No, I mean, that's the problem. And, of course, when the pendulum swings, and it always swings, then if you're completely, you know, you're completely dependent on the uh, on the out group or on the one, you know, on the in group at that point, it becomes the out group. And the and it just, it like you said, open, closed, open, closed. We become, you know, we're like the, the Pirates of the Caribbean running back and forth across a deck trying to roll the ship over. And that's what happens. Because we're running, we can't find that middle ground where we can work and steer from that location. And yes, maybe find some compromise, maybe find some people that we can convert to our cause. But at the same time, understand that people are going to disagree, and we've got to find some common ground in between those things. But you know, maybe that's a, I guess that's a deeper, broader, larger show at this point than what we got going on here. Maybe we should bring you and Mike Shower together uh, for a friendly discussion on pros and cons, and see what you guys can hash out between the two of you. That would be a fun. Uh, that would be a fun discussion for sure. Um, uh, and I know I'd probably got a better chance of getting you two together than maybe you and John Conkill. So uh, we'll have to see what goes on from there. And I would love to do that. I think that a, a conversation, uh, because I think that you and Mike agree on a lot of things, but at the same time. You come at it from slightly different perspectives and you respect each other. I think it would be a good conversation to be had just to talk about the pro cons um, in in uh, in broader terms. Because, again, you made me think about things that I hadn't considered before. And, and, you know, that's that's the idea behind more conversation. Whether you agree with it or not, it at least makes you think and and brings it from a you know, brings it from a different point of view. Um, and uh, 
Uh, I, I think that's important. Yeah, I, I want to find a solution on this. I mean, we, we've now gone six years without a fiscal plan uh, and, uh, and, and without people, you know, finding, without the broader legislature, at least finding the common ground. I mean, eight, the fiscal policy working group did, but without the broader legislature finding the common ground. And, and that's, to me, that's really the core of the whole CONCON issue, right? Finding a way to get a fiscal policy uh, a, a, a durable fiscal policy that uh, that will you know solve things, and so we can get on with considering whether we actually need a defined benefit program, can afford a defined benefit program, and the people who who would pay for it are willing to pay for it. I mean, that you, you need to know who's going to pay for it before you start passing right. things like that. Right. So the people who are going to pay for it can weigh in on whether or not you know that's something that uh, something that they want to pay for. So. Well. I, any way that we can find, you know, getting to that common ground, uh, I think is a good way. And Shower was on the fiscal policy working group. So as an alternate, so, you know, he, he will have some insights into, into whether that process is ever going to work. Well, yeah, uh, absolutely. I, but I think specifically, I definitely, cause he's been such a proponent of the constitutional convention and you've pointed out some of the pitfalls. I'd like to get his thoughts on, on some of that. And, you know, like I said, yeah. have kind of a mini discussion or even mini debate about, you know, whether or not he thinks that, you know, it's going to work out the way he thinks it works, going to work out or the way that you think it's going to work out. I think that's, that's an important consideration here. So, but uh, you're not wrong. You're not wrong on the other either. And yeah, the idea that somehow creating a new defined benefits program is going to be, it's going to work. I mean, you could just see defined benefits programs across the country. The 99% of them have crashed and burned. The other ones have had to be propped up and there are very few that have any kind of really successful track record. Uh, I mean, they have all most all the major ones have required millions of dollars in government bailouts to be able to make them work. And now we're jumping we're jumping back into that fire. It makes no sense. Yeah. And and Michael, that, you know, people are no doubt tired of me saying this, but but the, the top 20 percent don't care because they're assuming yeah. they don't have to pay for it. Right. Yeah. They're assuming it's going to be paid for through PFD cuts. So, you know, they don't care about whether you're voting for it or not. If we have a fiscal plan a fiscal solution that that includes them so that they pay a, a, a material share, just like middle and lower income Alaska families are pet, they pay a material share of it. I think I think the outcome of those sorts of votes are different. You know, Natasha says, wait, you're going to tax me to pay for a defined benefit plan? Oh, no, 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 no. We're, we're not going to go down that road. <laughs> well, it'll be an interesting discussion to say the least. So we'll We'll keep you in mind here. Maybe we'll dust something up here the next couple of weeks where we can do that. That would be a fun discussion. We'll do a Skype or a Zoom head-to-head -head, uh, discussion or something. Uh, Brad Keithley, thank you, my friend, for coming on board. It's good to talk with you. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. All right. Appreciate you coming on board. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.